The second attack, I guess, is the one that's captured on, on news film because he's in the middle of a photo opportunity reading to these uh, or listening to these children read uh, My Pet Goat mm -hmm. in the uh, elementary school class in Sarasota, yeah. Florida. Yeah. My personal analysis of this is that he is frozen in fear, terror, and panic. He does not know what to do. And he sits there waiting for somebody to tell him what it is he must do. He is not an active president. He doesn't call for telephones. He doesn't issue a parade of crisp orders. He doesn't say, scramble every fighter, bring down all planes, close the borders, go to red alert. Nothing of the kind. He sits there, and we know that his press secretary, Ari Fleischer, is in the back of the room holding up a big placard saying, don't say anything. Don't comment. Um, this is obviously not a president. This is a puppet. This is a figurehead. This is a ceremonial figure, if you like. That is how Bush tried to explain his behavior to the 9-11 Commission when he was interviewed. Of course, he had to, he had to be interviewed together with Cheney. The, the reports are that he was sitting on Cheney's lap while he gave this interview. And there are other reports that Cheney was sitting on, the wi on his wife's lap uh, because that's how he has to appear. Cheney can't appear without his wife, and Bush can't appear without Cheney. So Bush said, I sat there and tried to project calm and strength. Now this is a, an absurdity that is verging on, on pandemonium of insanity. Uh, he simply doesn't know what to do. He's got to be told what to do. There's the other dimension, is that as, as you read, for example, in my book, I devote a whole chapter to Bush's behavior and movements on this day, because I consider it to be of critical importance. Uh, a Secret Service agent, hearing the news of either the first or the second plane hitting the buildings in Manhattan, said, we're out of here. That was standard operating procedure. The standard operating procedure is, is if a major terror event is in progress. The president has to be taken to a secure location. Uh, we know, for example, Cheney, obviously considered much more important, was literally picked up and carried from his office in the White House down into the bunker in the, in the sub-sub basement, where, where he would probably be safe from a, from a direct air, air, airplane impact, maybe. But in the case of Bush, despite the fact that one Secret Service agent says, we're out of here, they don't move him. He stays there. Somehow that impulse is overridden. The standard operating procedure is abandoned. And Bush is essentially left there as a sitting duck. I don't believe reports of conspiracy theorists who say, well, they let him stay there because they were all in on it. They all knew everything that was happening. The invisible government, the coup faction or putsch faction, behind 9-11 is in the federal government, but they don't issue engraved invitations to their terrorist actions. They confront somebody like Bush with a fait accompli, and we'll get into that perhaps in a second, but they left him there as a very inviting target. There's good research by Daniel Hopsicker that there had been something resembling an assassination attempt against Bush in the morning. A camera crew showed up at Bush's hotel in Longboat Key in Florida on the morning of 9-11 at seven, 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning and they said we're here to do an interview. The Secret Service allegedly said we don't know anything about that interview, go away. The guess might be that uh, it might be a Maksud operation. In other words, Maksud uh, was uh, a leader of the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan. He had been assassinated several days before by a camera crew of suicide bombers who came in and instead of having a camera, as we do here, I hope, they had an exploding bomb that killed all of them, but killed Maksud as well. Um, I would ascribe that to the CIA rather than to, uh, rather than to anybody else, because they, needed, they, they didn't want a nationalist like Maksud uh, running the Northern Alliance. He would have been too difficult to handle. He was somebody who had stood up to the Soviets. He wouldn't hesitate to stand up to the, to the punks from the CIA and, and, and the U.S. forces. So, assassination attempt in the morning, hung out to dry, essentially left there, security stripped in the morning, then Air Force One takes off, no fighter escorts are there, 
And there's also a tremendous reluctance on the part of the pilot of Air Force One to tell the Air Force where he's going. The reports are that a couple of fighter jets finally appear, but they're simply told, follow Air Force One, we're not telling you where we're going. Doesn't really indicate too much trust in the military. Indicates rather that the people in Air Force One knew that they were in the midst of a military coup and that Bush might become expendable at any point in the day. And then above all, the centerpiece of 9-11, I think the single most important piece of evidence in the entire day, the incoming threat given to the Secret Service, Angel is next, meaning we will destroy Air Force One. And it doesn't just come with Angel is next, it then comes with a train of cosmic level code words, top secret code words, indicating that behind that threat is a network that has access to the most important secrets of a whole range of executive departments, presumably CIA, National Security Agency, Pentagon, FBI, Justice, Treasury even, the whole array. And that's a threat. The idea is, what they're saying to Bush is, you've got to go on television and start saying, Bin Laden, Bin Laden, Bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, 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 and you will remain in office. If you don't, you may be liquidated at any time. You may not see the end of this day. I think some, to some degree what's most interesting about 9-11 are the things that almost happened but didn't. What happened, of course, was a terrific tragedy, but the things that might have happened were even worse. The other thing the invisible government wanted uh, Bush to do, this coup faction, if you will, was to get on the phone with Putin and tell him, we are seizing Afghanistan now, and we're going to set up bases in your soft underbelly in the former Soviet republics of Central Asia. Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzia for starters, after that perhaps Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, uh, and the rest. Uh, that is a very dangerous move. Uh, that might have been uh, responded to by Putin with his own threats. He might have said no. So the invisible government had to have the possibility of nuclear escalation, and they did. They had it in two ways that we know of. One is that in the Angel is next phone call, they had code words that seemed to indicate that they had access to the nuclear launch codes, that they were able to somehow access the so-called football, the collection, the briefcases that are filled with these codes that accompany the president but are also kept in other places for use in case of all-out nuclear war. So the, the perpetrators of 9-11, the coup faction inside the U.S. government, have these codes, they can launch nuclear war that way. There's another way they could have launched it through an exercise called Global Guardian, because it just so happened that on the morning of 9-11 there was also an exercise simulating all-out thermonuclear war. And part of that exercise appears to have been an attempt as a part of the drill, as a part of the simulation, for a rogue faction to gain access to command and control systems that would give them the ability to launch missiles. So that might be the concrete, specific back door that the invisible government might have used in order to uh, escalate in the nuclear realm if that had become necessary. Essentially, the ultimatum to Bush is either you launch the war of civilizations against the Arabs and the Islamic world in Afghanistan, later in Iraq, you launch it in conventional form, or we will launch it ourselves in nuclear form. In other words, we can incinerate Cairo, Damascus, Tehran, uh, you name it, Kabul, all of those places can be hit by missiles within minutes. We'll do that and leave you to deal with the consequences. Now, of course, one of the overtones of this, and I'm, I'm relying here on, just in terms of the sources, the Réseau Voltaire, presumably having the benefit of the French intelligence services, Secondly, Debka, a website that is close, I believe, to the views of the Israeli Mossad. And then another one called Namakon, which is a group of KGB Soviet intelligence veterans. They seem to converge on this hypothesis that uh, there was a nuclear option built into it. 
And uh, the only, they, essentially it's an ultimatum telling Bush that the only way you can remain in office is if you begin to preach the war of civilizations and, uh, and act in the way that we are, we are demanding. There's also reports through the Razor Voltaire in particular that Tony Blair was on the phone actively with Bush telling him, you've got to go on television and say Al-Qaeda bin Laden. And of course for that there was absolutely no proof. There was no scrap of proof in the world that, that bin Laden, Al-Qaeda had anything to do with this. Uh, and indeed, uh, the, the FBI has admitted that in going into Afghanistan, they never found anything, not one line, not one scrap that would have anything to do with the events uh, of 9-11. So I think the, the um, scratching the surface on 9-11, what is revealed is a horror that is much greater than even the one that we saw.